Welcome to DG Reads the Classics. We'll get on with the show in just a moment, but first, a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Improv. Always fresh, never frozen, or pre-packaged. It's Improv. It's always new. And it always tastes different. Improv. And Socks. Cut down on that needless, stinky feet shame with Socks. Stay tuned after the chapter for a special ad from our sponsors, Socks. And also Rice Crackers. Welcome to Chapter 4 of Journey to the Center of the Earth, written by Jules Verne, narrated and commentated by yours truly, DG. Let's get right to it. All right. Also, hey, just want to say thanks for being here. Thanks for taking a listen. Hope you guys are having a good time. Be sure to hang out till after the chapter is over to listen to a very special, very inconsequential ad. (laughs) Let's get to it. We got a lot to do. We better get to it. Okay, here we go. Chapter 4. The Enemy to be Starved into Submission. He is gone! cried Martha, running out of her kitchen at the noise of the violent slamming of doors. Yes, I replied. Completely gone. As opposed to partially gone, I guess. Just one foot in or out of the door. Maybe it's raining. He's looking for a umbrella. I don't know. Well, what about his dinner? said the old servant. He won't have any. And his supper? He won't have any. What? cried Martha with clasped hands. Dinner and supper equal purpose for Martha. No, my dear Martha, he will eat no more. No one in the house is to eat anything at all. Uncle Leidenbrock is going to make us all fast until he has succeeded in deciphering an undecipherable scrawl. Oh, my dear, must we then all die of hunger? I hardly dared confess that, with so absolute a ruler as my uncle, this fate was inevitable. The old servant, visibly moved, returned to the kitchen, moaning piteously. What, like a ghost, like Jacob Marley? Rattling pots and pans? Oh, dinner! (laughs) When I was alone, I thought I would go and tell Groban all about it. But how should I be able to escape from the house? The professor might return at any moment, and suppose he called me, and suppose he tackled me again with this logomancy. Nope. Logomachy? Logomachy. Logomachy. L-O-G-O-M-A-C-H-Y. I feel like a fool. I'm going to look it up. Right. So, I looked it up. I was wrong. Logomachy is the word and argument about words themselves. I just, I've, I don't think I've ever come across that word before in my life. And suppose he tackled me again with this logomachy, which might vainly have been set before ancient Oedipus. And if I did not obey his call, who could answer for what might happen? It sounds like everybody just kind of keeps this guy intact. Like if people are not around to absorb his ire, he just kind of blows up. The wisest course was to remain where I was. A mineralogist at Besançon had just sent us a collection of siliceous nodules, which I had to classify. So, I set to work. I sorted, labeled, and arranged in their own glass case all these hollow specimens, in the cavity of each of which was a nest of little crystals. Riveting. But this work did not succeed in absorbing all of my attention. Gee, I can't imagine how it couldn't have. All those little crystals, ooh, look, would just be happening on repeat in my mind for a good, I don't even know how long. Shows you how easily distracted I am. That old document kept working in my brain. My head throbbed with excitement, and I felt an undefined uneasiness. Could be just, uh, you know, dehydration and maybe a gurgly tummy. I was possessed with a presentiment of coming evil. Yeah, that's definitely signs of diarrhea. In an hour, my nodules were all arranged upon successive shelves. 
Then I dropped down into an old velvet armchair, my head thrown back and my hands joined over it. I lighted my long crooked pipe with a painting of an idle-looking naiad. Then I assumed myself watching the process of the conversion of the tobacco into carbon, which was by slow degrees making my naiad into a negress. Oh, the words of a hundred years ago. It's like those pens that you turn upside down and the bathing suit disappears. Except with race. Now and then I listened to hear whether a well-known step was on the stairs. No. Where could my uncle be at that moment? I fancied him running under the noble trees which lined the road to Altona, gesticulating, making shots with his cane, thrashing the long grass, cutting the heads off of the thistles, and disturbing the contemplative storks in their peaceful solitude. It's a very eloquent description of someone seizuring in a field. Would he return in triumph or discouragement? Which would get the upper hand? He or the secret? I was thus asking myself questions and mechanically taking between my fingers the sheet of paper mysteriously disfigured with the incomprehensible succession of letters I had written down, and I repeated to myself, what does it all mean? I sought to group the letters so as to form words. Quite impossible. When I put them together by twos, threes, fives, or sixes, nothing came of it but nonsense. To be sure, the fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth letters made the English word ice. The eighty-third and two following made sir. And in the midst of the document, in the second and third lines, I observed the words rots, mutable, ira, net, atra. Come now, I thought. These words seem to justify my uncle's view about the language of the document. In the fourth line appeared the word luco, L-U-C-O, which means a sacred wood. It is true that in the third line was the word to build, T-A-B-I-L-E-D, someone let me know if I'm doing that one wrong, which looked like Hebrew, and in the last, the purely French words M-E-R, mer, arc, A-R-C, mer, M-E-R-E. All of this was enough to drive a poor fellow crazy. You and me both. Four different languages in this ridiculous sentence. What concoction could there possibly be between such words as ice, sir, anger, cruel, sacred wood, changeable, mother, bow, and sea? The first and the last might have been something to do with each other. It was not at all surprising that in a document written in Iceland, there should be mention of a sea of ice. But it was quite another thing to get to the end of this cryptogram with so small a clue. So I was struggling with an insurmountable difficulty. My brain got heated, my eyes watered over that sheet of paper. Its 132 letters seemed to flutter and fly around me like the motes of mingled light and darkness, which float in the air around the head when the blood is rushing upwards with undue violence. Yep, things flutter and fly around my head all the time when I get upset. It's a self-induced trip, a self-induced anger trip. I was a prey to a kind of hallucination. Oh, look at that. I was stifling. I wanted air. Unconsciously, I fanned myself with the bit of paper, the back and front of which successfully came before my eyes. What was my surprise then, in one of those rapid revolutions? At the moment when the back was turned to me, I thought I caught sight of the Latin words craterum, terrestre, and others. A sudden light burst in upon me. These hints alone gave me the first glimpse of the truth. I had discovered the key to the cipher. To read the document, it would not even be necessary to read it through the paper, such as it was, just such as it had been dictated to me, so it might be spelt out with ease. All those ingenious professorial combinations were coming right. He was right as to the arrangement of the letters. He was right as to the language. He had been within a hair's breadth of reading this Latin document from end to end, but that hair's breath, chance, had given it to me. Chance and a rage hallucination. You may be sure I felt stirred up. My eyes were dim, I could scarcely see. I had laid the paper upon the table. At a glance, I could tell the whole secret. At last, I became more calm. I made a wise resolve to walk twice around the room quietly and settle my nerves and then I returned into the deep gulf of the huge armchair. 
Now I'll read it, I cried after having well distended my lungs with air. A lot of people spoke to themselves out loud way back when. This, uh, I don't know, hey, who knows, there's benefits to it. <laughs> I'm doing it right now. I leaned over the table, I laid my fingers successively upon every letter, and without a pause, without one moment's hesitation, I read off the whole sentence aloud. Stupefaction. Terror. I sat overwhelmed. First of all, stupefaction. Oh my goodness. That's a four-syllable word for surprise. Stupefaction. Terror. I sat overwhelmed as if with a sudden deadly blow. What? That which I had read had actually really been done. A mortal man had the audacity to penetrate. Ah! I cried, springing up. But no, 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 no. My uncle shall never know it. He would insist upon doing it too. He would want to know all about it. Ropes could not hold him, such a determined geologist as he is. He would start, he would, in spite of everything and everybody, and he would take me with him. And we should never get back. Nope, never, never. My overexcitement was beyond all description. No, no, it shall not be, I declared energetically. And as it is in my power to prevent the knowledge of it coming into the mind of my tyrant, I will do it. By dint of turning this document round and round, he too might discover the key. Oh, I will destroy it. There was a little fire left on the hearth. I seized not only the paper, but sacked Newsom's parchment. With a feverish hand, I was about to fling it all upon the coals and utterly destroy and abolish this dangerous secret when the study door opened and my uncle appeared. Bit of a cliffhanger there. End of chapter four. Thank you all for joining me. If you liked it enough, go ahead and click and like and subscribe and do all those fun things. And hang tight. In just a little while, you hear a little funny ad for a little funny something, something, something. <laughs> hey, thanks for hanging out. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And uh, come on back for chapter five. Hey, dude. Hey, bro. Hey, notice anything different? Um, oh, check out the fancy footwear. Nice shoes, bro. Thanks, dude. Been taking your advice, been going online, doing some shopping. You want to take a closer look? You know I do. Bring them on over. Here, okay, let me just... Eh, and, eh. Oh, oh, bro. Oh, bro, no. No, bro, no. Back away. Back away fast. Oh, oh, that's, oh, oh it's like wet corn and oh, tomato soup or uh, uh, some fish in there. I don't even, oh, your feet smell. Dude, uh, dude, what? I know. I know, dude. And I don't know what to do. I see people staring at me in the elevator, like when we're standing on the corner of the crosswalk and people are like looking around like, what is that? And they know it's me and I know it's me and I don't know what to do. Dude, just get some socks. You know, like underwear for your feet. What? My feet need underwear? No, 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 no. They need socks. Okay, bro. So your feet, they're like, you know, any other part of your body. They sweat. And if they're enclosed, particularly in any kind of dead animal skin, they're gonna smell, brah, like they are right now. Okay. So just get some socks, all right? Just get some socks. Do the world a favor. Do yourself a favor. Get some socks. The underwear for your feet. Huh. And I bet I could probably just order them. Yeah, you can order them online. You should have ordered them online with your shoes. They usually go together. Socks and shoes. Shoes and socks. Hey, one day at a time, okay? You're right. You're right. That's all we can do. One day at a time. I'm with you, brah. And those are nice shoes. Just, you know, wear them with socks. <laughs> socks. Helping you lose excessive amounts of shame when you're around other people. One day at a time, brah. You want some rice crackers or anything? Yeah, I love some rice crackers. Those are good. Gluten-free? All right. All right. Just hook yourself up and click that link. Is there somebody else here? I just, who are you talking? Don't worry about it.